Chapter 17 My watch looked entirely normal. I spent the morning pulling it apart and inspecting each tiny mechanism. Nothing was out of place. There were no hidden striking trains, hammers, gongs or repeaters. It couldn't possibly have chimed. I put it back together, a familiar task I could do without even looking. It hadn't been the first watch I'd ever worked on, but it was the one I'd opened up the most. My parents gave it to me on my 16th birthday. The silver case was monogrammed with my initials and a message congratulating me on my birthday was etched inside. It was my most cherished possession. Somehow, it had saved my life. A knock on my door and Willie called out, It's me. May I speak with you, India? Of course, come in. She opened the door just enough to squeeze through and leaned back against it. She bit her lip and looked everywhere but at me. Is there something I can do for you, Willie? She huffed out a breath. I wouldn't really have cut you up, you know. I pinched the back of my hand to stop myself smiling. I know. Thank you for reassuring me. Matt says you're going to stay. I'm to be his aunt's companion. I hadn't had time to discuss the new arrangement with either of them, but I felt immeasurably lighter since the decision had been made. The weight of uncertainty over my future had been pressing down on me without me realising. She rushed forward and grasped my forearms. You won't give up on finding the watchmaker, will you? Matt no longer needs my help. We've called on every watchmaker I know. Cyclops is capable of taking him to... No, you must help. You know London better than any of us, and you know watches too. She dug her fingers into my arms. You've seen what his watch does, India. It's of vital importance that he gets it fixed. It seems to work perfectly well. It rejuvenates him when he uses it. It's slowing down. She let me go and perched on the edge of the dressing table where I'd been working. She lowered her head and some loose strands of hair fell over her face. It no longer works for days as it used to. It will stop altogether one day. And there's no one else who can fix it? None that we know of. What sort of watchmaker fixed a life-giving, magical watch? A magician, I supposed. The notion was utterly absurd, yet I couldn't shake it. I will help Matt whenever he requires it, I assured her. Now tell me, will you come shopping with Miss Glass and me later? We would enjoy your company. Why? She plucked the fabric of her trousers at her thighs. I'm a terrible judge of fashion. Or are you secretly hiding your femininity as a mode of protection? She screwed up her face in a most unladylike expression. Not damn likely. Besides, I can't come shopping. I'm going to see Travers again to tell him I've decided to play for my locket. No, Willie, you shouldn't. You promised Matt. She strode to the door. I have to. How? You said you had no money. I don't need money. You've asked Matt for a loan? She shook her head. He's got too much on his plate. She jerked the door open, surprising her cousin, who had his fist poised to knock. He stepped aside with a raise of his brows as she stormed past him. Why is she in a foul mood? He asked. She was contrite when I spoke to her earlier. I sighed. She's still upset about her locket. I didn't tell him she was planning on gambling to win it back. It was none of my affair, and she wouldn't like me to tattle. How are you feeling this morning? Better. He did look better, but I'd come to expect to see the tiredness in his eyes now. But not completely healthy. A beat passed. Two. I don't expect to be, he said. My heart ached. What an awful thing to always feel tired, to be worried about one's health. No one should have to, particularly not a young, athletic and capable man like Matt. Don't.
down, India. The low ebb of his voice washed over me. Don't pity me. Easy enough to say, not so easy to do. I studied the watch in my hand, tracing my thumbnail over the monogram. Tell me about your magic watch, Matt. Tell me everything. He touched his waistcoat pocket. Perhaps he didn't want to be parted from it for one moment, even at home. Having witnessed what happened when he was separated from it for too long, I could see why. He closed the door and sat on the trunk at the foot of the bed. He leaned his elbows on his knees and looked at me. So, you believe in magic? I... I don't know yet. It seems so childish and fantastical. Yet I've seen things. Tell me what you know, and tell me why I've never heard of such things as magical, health-giving watches before. You've never heard of them because magic has been suppressed for hundreds of years. Magicians were almost wiped out in medieval times, after a small group committed heinous crimes using their magic. People panicked and attacked all magicians, not just the guilty few. Those who managed to escape have kept their secret all these years, out of fear. I nodded, hardly daring to breathe. Could such a story truly be possible? How do you know all this? One of the men who gave me this watch told me about it. One of them was a watchmaker known as Kronos, the other a surgeon. They saved my life. Surgeon? I think you need to start from the beginning. He cast me a crooked smile. I will, Miss Impatience. Five years ago, I nearly died from a bullet wound, the wound my grandfather gave me as it happens. Oh, Matt, I murmured. No pity, India. I pressed my lips together and nodded. I was in a town called Broken Creek, and the gunfight happened outside the saloon. A surgeon from one of the most prestigious hospitals in New York also happened to be in town. What was he doing so far away from home in a tiny backwater? He was an alcoholic. He'd been given leave to dry out. Unfortunately for him, he didn't try very hard. Fortunately for me, I was shot at ten in the morning when the saloon hadn't yet opened. He was an excellent surgeon, even with a shaking hand. Was? He's dead. I know that for certain, because I went in search of him before I came here. I spoke to him just days before his death. Considering how much he drank, I was surprised he lived so long. I knew his name, you see, and I hoped he knew the real name of Kronos. They worked together on my surgery after the gunfight. I don't recall any of it, but Duke, Cyclops and Willie said it was both nightmarish and a dream come true. They told me Dr. Parsons worked on me on a table in the saloon, He'd removed the bullet, but my life was slipping away, and he hadn't sutured the wound yet. I was going to die unless a miracle could be produced. Or magic? He nodded. My friends told me that a small crowd gathered to watch Dr. Parsons work on me. Another man came forward. I'd seen him talking to Parsons some evenings in the saloon, he asked Parsons if he wanted to try his idea out, and Parsons replied that the, there was no chance of my survival using normal surgical methods. Duke told me that no one knew what the men meant, but Willie screamed at them to try whatever they wanted to make me live. They ordered everyone to leave, but Willie hid beneath a table in the shadows. According to her account, the man who called himself Kronos searched my person and found my watch. He patted his pocket again. Willie almost revealed herself to accuse him of theft, but when she saw what he did with it, she remained hidden. What did he do? I asked, breathless. Kronos held my watch in his hand, palm up, closed his eyes and whispered some words. The watch began to glow, but neither man was alarmed. 
Willie thinks I stopped breathing at that point because Parsons shouted, Now, it must be now. Kronos took my hand and placed it over his, the watch between. As he chanted, Willie saw the purplish glow infuse itself into my skin and spread through my veins. I've seen it work, I said. He arched one brow and grunted. Go on, then what happened? Willie tells me that Dr. Parsons worked on me again, sewing up my wound while Kronos continued to chant as he held the watch against my palm. When Parsons finished, he told Kronos it was done, and Kronos placed the watch over the wound. Dr. Parsons took over the chant, and the watch suddenly flared. Willie said she thought it had caught fire, but the light quickly faded away to nothing. My veins ceased glowing too. That's when she noticed my chest rise with a deep breath. I remember everything from that moment on. It's so clear, like it happened yesterday. I sat up. They gave me a dram of whiskey. I was still covered in blood, but the wound had been sewn up. That's when Dr. Parsons handed me the watch. He and Kronos explained that it would keep me alive. Whenever I felt unnaturally tired, I should hold the watch in my palm and it would work its magic on me and bring me back to life. I thought them utterly mad and told them so. They looked at one another, sighed, then told me I could go to hell. They didn't care what became of me. But there was something in their eyes. Elation, I think, like they'd won a victory. They patted one another on the back and paid each other compliments. They began discussing the future of their discovery and what it would mean for the world. But they disagreed on whether it should be brought to light. I had no idea what they were talking about, but it seemed not to concern me. It was like I wasn't important. You just happened to be the closest dying man, I said. They wanted to experiment with magic, and you were there at the right time. It surprised me that I'd accepted his story and the idea of magic so easily. But I trusted him, and trusted that he wouldn't believe without solid evidence. What happened after that? Did you see the men in Broken Creek again? He shook his head. I got up and left. Sometime later, Willie found me. She was in shock. She told me what she'd witnessed in the saloon. None of us believed her at first, but a week later, when I began to feel exhausted for no good reason, she suggested I hold my watch in the palm of my hand and see what happened. I thought her mad and refused. I quickly became ill, weak and close to death. The doctors didn't know what was wrong with me. Willie simply placed the watch in my hand one day as I lay in bed, and I immediately felt restored to normal health. Not like you see me now, but completely better. The glowing veins didn't alarm you. Terrified me. But I could feel the benefits to my health immediately. I didn't let the watch go until I felt completely well again. The four of us discussed what it could mean, how it had happened. Cyclops had heard stories about magic, but only in whispers. We asked his grandmother, but she refused to talk about it. She said magic was dangerous and was kept secret from the world for a reason. She did tell us that people were born magic, to magic parents. But it was a skill that required training to work efficiently. From Willie's account of the surgery, it was clear that Parsons and Kronos had worked together somehow, and they were both magicians. For five years... I used the watch whenever I felt unnaturally tired, and it worked perfectly. But four months ago, its power waned, and I needed it more often. I knew I had to seek out Parsons and Kronos. Before it stopped working altogether, I said on a breath. He gave a slight nod. My throat clogged. I tried not to show pity, but I don't think I was very good at keeping my thoughts to myself. He studied his hands. I knew nothing about Kronos, but I knew where Parsons worked, so we went to New York. 
He was on his deathbed with only days to live. What did he say? That he regretted experimenting on me. Why? Because it was playing God. It was Kronos' idea to bring me back to life, and Barsons felt he'd been coerced into it. He hadn't seen Kronos since that day. Had he performed much magic before then? Only rarely. He thinks he must have mentioned it to Kronos in his drunken state one day in Broken Creek, and Kronos, also being a magician, began to discuss mad theories and ways to combine their magic. Parsons explained that there were different styles of magic based on one's profession or skill. As a doctor, his own magic helped him heal people, but he couldn't give them back their life, only extend it for short periods of time. He claimed it was almost useless for that reason. An engineer can create superior strength steel, but again it only lasts for short periods of time. A carpenter can infuse wood so that it doesn't burn, but it doesn't last more than a few hours. But Kronos had discovered a way to combine his magic with that of the other types to extend it, I said. My God! It was genius and thrilling. He is so strange. Part of me couldn't believe I was discussing magic without giggling. Perhaps tomorrow I would wake up from this dream and laugh about it. But Matt's grim nod was very real. Kronos had never combined his magic with the doctors before. Indeed, he'd only worked with carpenters and the like until that day in Broken Creek. Kronos knew he could extend the magic of other magicians, but extending the life of a dying man had never been tried, to his knowledge. It's quite remarkable. So Parsons put his magic into the watch too. The magic from both magicians exists in the watch and in me. The two entities cannot be separated for long or the magic fades, and the watch cannot work on another human, only me. It's a part of me as much as my heart or lungs. That's why it doesn't glow when anyone else holds it, I said more to myself than him. Did Parsons tell you what happened between he and Kronos after they healed you? After the euphoria of their success wore off, Parsons told Kronos that he had reservations. He said he would never work with Kronos again to save a life. Kronos flew into a rage. He said they were on the verge of something monumentally important to the human race. But Parsons was afraid of what could happen if the magic fell into the wrong hands. Kronos was furious. He never actually met a magical doctor before, and he feared he'd never find another in his lifetime. Apparently, they're the rarest magicians. I wonder if he did ever meet another. Matt shrugged. Parsons couldn't help me fix the watch. As the problem is in the horology magic, not the medical magic, a timepiece magician is required to service the watch. No ordinary watchmaker can do it. What about a different magic watchmaker? I asked, curling my fingers around my watch. One who isn't Kronos, but is a magician. Parsons seemed to think only the original magician can fix it. I looked down at my fist. My watch's case felt cool now, not warm as it had the evening before when McTierney attacked me. I swallowed heavily. My mind was a jumble of questions and theories, all vying for attention. I managed to sort through them. There was only one pressing point. What if Parsons was wrong? Matt, I whispered, looking up at him. He crouched before me. His gaze searched mine, worried and yet curious too. What is it, India? Last night... My watch wrapped itself around McTierney's wrist and shocked him. It almost killed him. I opened my fist and he plucked the watch off my palm. He inspected it and opened the case. 
Did your father make it? I nodded. Do you think he could have been a magician? I don't know, but that watch chimed and moved of its own accord. I think the clock in the gambling house saved me too. I told him how it had dipped unexpectedly when I threw it to knock over Lord Denison. That reminds me, he said darkly. I ought to pay him a visit. You'll do no such thing. The incident is in the past. Anyway, what I'm trying to tell you is, I handled that clock. I toyed with its mechanisms for something to do while Willie played. Just as I've taken this watch apart and put it back together dozens of times. His eyes widened. You think you're a magician? I admit that I've wondered. My watch feels warmer when you're near, as if it's responding to your presence. I lifted one shoulder. I don't know what to think. The entire concept of magic is so new to me and so very strange. I know nothing about it. He placed the watch back in my palm and closed his hand around mine. I know so little as well. Matt, if I am... I might be able to help you. I placed my hand over the pocket of his waistcoat. His watch heated at my touch. We both felt it. He swallowed hard and nodded. Then he pulled the watch out. Take it apart. Do whatever you did to your watch and that clock and we'll see if it makes a difference. I didn't tell him. I already had done so before taking it to him at Vine Street Police Station. Perhaps now I knew a little more, my magic would show me what to do. I set to work immediately. He didn't stay. I removed the parts and laid them out. I cleaned them, inspected them, and returned them to their place again. It was easy, the mechanism was uncomplicated, but I felt no strange pull, no magic at work. Matt returned, carrying tea and sandwiches on a tray. Aunt is asking when you'll be ready to go shopping, he said, setting it down beside me. You finished? I snapped the watch case closed and held it out to him by the chain. He accepted it and closed his fist around it. It immediately glowed and the magic flowed into him, lighting his veins. I watched its progress up his throat, over his face to his hairline. He breathed, breathed again, then returned it to his pocket. His colour returned to normal. Well, I prompted, no longer able to sit. How do you feel? Like I could kiss you. My breath hitched. So it works more efficiently now? I don't know. I won't know for a few more hours, but I still want to kiss you. He smiled. He looked happier than I'd ever seen him. I've shocked you. Yes, I said, turning away so he couldn't see my flushed face. Tell me how you feel later. Matt's watch was not fixed. He still needed to use it every few hours instead of every week, like it had once been. He told me in private in the library after dinner. I just used it again, he said. I clasped my brandy tumbler in both hands and stared into the liquid. My vision blurred. I swallowed the entire contents. I'm sorry, Matt. He plucked the glass out of my hand. It's not your fault. I know. I said heavily, yet I felt like I'd failed him. Do you think my magic is different to Kronos's? I've been considering that, but I honestly don't know. I wonder if your magic is simply raw. Perhaps with training, you could extend the life of my watch. But there was no one to train me, and with magic being such a deep secret, we were unlikely to find a magician in the newspaper advertisements. Even worse we were unlikely to find Kronos himself. Perhaps if we discuss this development with the Guild... No. He slammed the glass down on the table. No, India, you are not to mention magic to them. You saw their faces. They already dislike you. 
this will make it worse for you. Besides, from what Dr. Parsons told me, the authorities are the most fearful of magicians. We don't have guilds in America, but there are committees and other groups that govern trades and crafts. He claimed magicians are not welcome. They're reviled, in fact. You must keep your magic a secret, India. Understand? I nodded. Since Abercrombie and the other members were fearful of me, they must have suspected I possessed magic, I said. But how? Did they sense it, do you think? Perhaps. Or did they know your father was magic, even though he didn't use it? Perhaps they learned as much when he was dying, since you said it wasn't until around that time that they became fearful of you. A little before, when he tried to get them to admit me to the guild, I said absently, but father wasn't a magician. I would have known or suspected. He was never anything but normal. He refilled my glass from the decanter on the sideboard and handed it to me. I'm sure there's a logical explanation. I sighed. I suppose there must be. I drank in silence, feeling his intense gaze on me, but not daring to meet it. My cheeks were warm enough. Tell me what you said to Abercrombie to get him to cease accusing me of theft. He claimed you threatened him. <laughs> it was hardly a threat. I merely explained that I work for the police on two continents and I'm a personal friend to Commissioner Monroe. As such, Monroe was more likely to believe my account of events over his. That's it. There were no threats made to his person. I may have used language in a tone of voice that seems to scare some people easily. Ah, yes, that voice. I've heard it. I smiled. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. He waved a hand. It's nothing. It didn't feel like nothing, but I let the matter rest. Do the others know that I've tried to fix your watch? He nodded. They've been urging me to ask you. He fished in his inside jacket pocket and pulled out an envelope. There's another reason I called in here. Oh? This arrived for you while you were out. I wanted to give it to you in private. It was a telegram all the way from America. It says that Dorchester is indeed Patrick McTierney. I read on and gasped. The reward will be sent to me at this address in gold bullion. I bit my lip but couldn't stop my smile. I reread the telegram, then looked up at Matt. He smiled. I am to get the reward? Of course. But he was here because of you. You caught him. It's your job and you have all these people to support. India, I'm a man of independent means. My father saw to that. He worked hard after he escaped his family here and built a property empire that spans the globe. I don't need the reward money. His eyes sparkled as he perched on the table next to me. So what'll you do with it? I don't know. How much is two thousand dollars in English money? About four hundred pounds. Four hundred? I downed the rest of my brandy in one gulp. Matt took the glass off me. Steady, India, or I'll have to carry you to your room. I hardly heard him. Four hundred pounds was more than my father earned in a year. Was it enough to buy my own shop and equipment? Was it enough to buy out Eddie? Perhaps, but I still couldn't be a shopkeeper. The Guild would never grant me a license. I could buy myself a small house and rent out a spare room to lodgers. The possibilities were endless and rather exciting. Even better, I didn't have to make a decision yet. For now, I would remain as Miss Glass's companion and live at Park Street. Matt, do you know a man of business here in London who can help me invest the gold for the time being? My father's lawyer will know someone. Nothing risky, I don't want to lose it. Then perhaps a bank vault for now, until such time as you need it. He lifted his glass in salute. Congratulations, India. You're now a woman of independent means. You deserve it. Warmth spread through me at his crooked smile. The brandy must be taking effect. Matt, Duke shouted from just outside the door. Matt, you in here? 
He pushed open the door and grunted. Good, go and stop your harebrained cousin from ruining her life. Matt glanced at me and sighed. He set his glass down and pushed off from the table. What's she doing now? Going to meet Lord Travers to try and win back a locket? How? Matt asked. She hasn't got anything left to gamble with. She's wearing a dress. Hell, Matt stormed out of the library, leaving me wondering how Willie wearing a dress was a problem. And then it struck me. She was going to offer herself to Lord Travers as payment. I picked up my skirts and raced after Duke and Matt. I found them confronting Willie in her room. She'd applied some colour to her cheeks and lips, and her hair flowed around her shoulders. She was beautiful. You look like a whore, Duke snarled. That's the point, she shot back. She eyed Matt, standing with rigid shoulders, his entire body expanding with his deep breaths. I suspected the deep breathing was an attempt to control his temper, but it wasn't working particularly well. I was glad the hard gleam in his eye wasn't directed at me. I stepped between them. I'll lend you the money, I told Willie. I have some coming to me shortly. Perhaps Lord Travers will accept a promissory for now? Willie blinked at me, but it didn't stop her eyes filling with tears. You would do that for me? Of course. I can't accept it. This is my predicament, and I'll get myself out of it. Thank you, but I don't want your money. Or yours, Matt. I'm not offering you any, he snarled. I'm going to win the locket back for you. Get your coat. He turned and marched out of the room. Is he a good poker player? I asked when he was out of earshot. He's the best there is, Willie said quietly. Was, Duke said. He hasn't played since the gunfight with his grandfather. He gave up all his gambling and drinking ways after that. It's not something you forget, Willie told him. You better hope not. Come on, let's go. I'll get my coat, I said, hurrying to my own room. Mr Unger agreed to the private game between Lord Travers and Matt. The hush that had descended upon our entrance lifted as excited voices eagerly placed wages on who would win. All the games were suspended so everyone could watch. Unger rearranged the furniture and Travers and Matt took their seats. Lord Denison wedged himself between me and Duke. The scar on his forehead from the wound inflicted by the clock looked red and raw. What a pleasant surprise, he murmured thickly in my ear. If your friend loses, will you wager yourself this time? I'll be tempted to play. He was suddenly ripped away. Matt held him by the collar, pulling it tight and high at Denison's throat. Denison's struggles only managed to give him a red face and score a few laughs from the others at his expense. Is this a fellow? Matt growled at me. I lifted my chin. If it is, what will you do to him? Matt looked to Denison, then to me, then to the table. Take him for every last penny. In that case, yes it is. Excited whispers rippled through the crowd. They scented a dangerously thrilling game ahead. Matt shoved Denison down onto a chair. If you don't play, I'll take you out the back and flog you. This is outrageous, Denison spluttered. Do you know who I am? Enlighten me. Denison plucked at his collar and stretched his neck. I'm Lord Denison, the son of the Earl of Morecambe. Travers snorted. It's not important. Come now, let's play. He lit a cigar and leaned back in his chair. Stand, Matt ordered. Pardon? Travers chomped on his cigar and didn't move. Stand up so I can see that you're not hiding anything. Check his pockets, Willie said. Bloody hell, Travers muttered but he pushed his chair back and heaved himself up. Never been treated this way by an Englishman. Duke checked Travers' pockets and the chair itself and declared he found nothing untoward. 
Travis snorted as he sat. I'm not a cheat. I elbowed Willie when she opened her mouth to protest. She shut it with a grumble. Deal, Matt ordered the dealer. What have you got to stake? He asked Dennison. Nothing, Dennison said. Lost it all at hazard. Did you come in a conveyance? Of course. Then I accept that. Lord Dennison lost his conveyance on the first hand. He slunk away from the table, his head low, muttering how his father was going to rake him over hot coals when he learned what he'd lost. Stay where I can see you, Matt ordered Dennison, pointing to a spot well away from me. Travers was a little harder to beat, but Matt did it with only a pair of eights after a mere ten hands were played. Travers could have won with his pair of jacks, but he folded too soon. He handed over the locket. Willie swooped on it and slipped it around her neck. Matt rose and nodded at the dealer and Unger. Wait, Travers cried when he realised Matt was leaving. Another game. Give me a chance to learn from you. Your skill is sublime. I couldn't get your measure at all, not even a little. He grabbed Matt's arm as he went to walk off, but missed and almost toppled off his chair. Come now, sir, we can make it as interesting as you like. I'm a bloody rich man. Ask anyone here. Matt gave him a look of utter contempt. Good evening to you. To Dennison, he said. Come and point out your carriage and tell your driver he's no longer required. Dennison followed us down the stairs, past the porters, his head low and shoulders stooped. Outside, a carriage came forward when one of the drivers recognised his master. Dennison gave him the bad news. The driver looked crestfallen. But I have a family. How will I feed them? Work for me, Matt said. I live at 16 Park Street. Duke, go with him. I'll go too, Willie said quickly, eyeing Matt. She must have suspected she'd be on the receiving end of his temper for some time and wanted to ward it off for as long as possible. May I humbly request a ride back home? Dennison asked. Walk, Matt growled. He held the door of his own carriage open for me and assisted me inside. He followed me and closed the door. Cyclops drove off, the other conveyance behind us. You play well, I ventured after two minutes of taut silence. He grunted. You won, Matt, so why are you angry? He'd been looking out the window, but he now turned to me. Some of the frostiness had already vanished from his eyes, but they were still cool. I'm not angry. I barked a laugh. He rubbed his eyes and I felt awful for mocking him. The poor man was exhausted. I possessed a lot of vices in my youth, he said. Gambling was one of them, as was drinking to excess, usually both at the same time. You don't have to explain, I said. I want to. I want you to know that I stopped because I didn't like the man I became when I gamble and drink like that. I gave up after I was shot, Things tend to fall into perspective when your life hangs in the balance. Neither of us spoke. The hissing of the carriage lamps and the clip-clop of the hooves and rumble of the wheels were the only sounds. The night air wasn't cold, but it was dense, confining. My corset felt too tight. I'm sorry, I said finally. For what? None of this is your fault for misjudging you. I see now that it's not anger, but tension. You wanted to get out of there quickly. I didn't even want to be in there, he said quietly. Sometimes. He removed his hat and dragged his hand through his hair. Sometimes I find it tempting. Yet you manage to have a drink or two without going to excess now. Why not a game of poker here and there? He shrugged. I didn't want to risk falling into old ways. I haven't played in years. We could play at home. That might satisfy Willie too and keep her from going out to find opponents. 
we don't have to play for money, but for something else, matches or tokens. His mouth hooked up at the corner, all mischief again. His tension vanished entirely. You want to learn to play poker, India? If you'll teach me, yes. His smile turned positively wicked. You'd better not wager anything you can't afford to lose. I smiled back, even though my heart fluttered madly. Nor had you. His eyes turned smoky. For the first time in my life, I think I'd like to lose. <laughs>